hope everyone can um, hear me okay. Um, first of all, I just want to, you know, obviously terrific Cavan did so well this year, um, but also the fact that Dublin continued to do so well. And, and I know there's a, a lot in the media out there around population and money and all this sort of stuff, but it's actually the people that are online tonight who have probably paid a part in some some form of player development over the last number of years and Jer and Owen and all his staff, kudos should go to you people as well because I know there's been tremendous work done over the last 20 years in Dublin and it's a credit to everyone who's involved and, and um, all Ireland's and, and championships and premierships are not won overnight and, and with embedded structures and with nearly 100 people online, you know, it's a credit to you to be able to um, have these resources available and then get your hands dirty at, at grassroots level. Um, so well done. So look, I hope everyone's doing okay. Um, you know, I know it's a, it's a strange time Ireland's in and the world's in at the moment. And we too were in a similar uh, situation in Melbourne, you know, five or six months ago, it seems like five or six years ago at this stage. So I understand um, where it's all going and it's very, very frustrating time. And the work that I'm currently doing around mental health is really highlighting that, especially in sport and just chatting with Ger off, off screen a few minutes ago around, you know, when games, underage games will start again and they just start here in Victoria and whatnot. But just the unknown certainty and the one thing that I would sort of comment on is just take day by day or week by week and, and keep active and, and keep doing things for you and, and, and some of your club people as well, because, you know, there will, there is light at the end of this tunnel. Um, so hopefully, you know, you'll all, all kick in um, and, and get some football played this year. Just in, in terms of tonight, um, the key outcomes is, uh, look, I don't want it to be a data dump because analysis can often be a data dump of, loads of stats and analysis and all that sort of stuff. Now, I, I am going to use some sort of things to highlight some of the ways that um, I, I'll build this story around tonight and, and, and compare some of the, the training and game plan essentials around some of the stuff I want to show you uh, and, and some of the stuff that we've used in the past here during my time at, at the GWS Giants. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to change or revolutionize the world, but I'm, I'm really keen for some questions and i know we've got some questions already which i have here uh, beside me um which hopefully i've built into the presentation that will present a comparative point of view uh, to the gea so if i haven't done that please ask uh, at the end hopefully the presentation will go for you know 30 40 minutes or so and gives us enough time uh, at the end uh, to answer those questions um, I do have a, a key philosophy around my coaching uh, and in, in particular the area of this performance analysis and this is probably coming from my times of playing when performance analysis was coming in and now when I'm in, in that sort of coaching uh, regime as well and, and often less is more. So just remember that point in terms of key analysis, you know, less is more, especially at, you know, club level or schools level that you may be coaching. And we've all heard of the of the saying, um, um, keep it simple, stupid. And I'm not saying by any means your players or you or my players or any players indeed are stupid or simple, but I believe in the concept less is more, as I, as I mentioned. And the key thing for me, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. Now, not all of us are coaching six-year-olds, but uh, we generally coach people that are, are most often older than us. Um, and I remember my time going back at uh, Cavan and, and some people might know of this guy worked uh, with Tyrone and I'm, I think he might have done work with Jim Gavin early days. Uh, but my time working with the county board, uh, we began to create a structure around high performance around 05, 06, 07 time uh, around performance, performance coaching, strategy and structure, development squads, etc. And I remember a guy called Bart McEnroe highlighting to a younger me. Um, when when Jer speaks of a younger me, that's probably 15 years ago at this stage, um, with whatever you're trying to create, the key message for him was whatever you're trying to create, make sure you share the same vision or picture with county board members and coaches that you're trying to coach. Because if people don't have the agreed picture or the same vision on the journey you're trying to go on, then you as a coach will get isolated. And most other people say, he or she's crazy. What are they doing? It, there's too much for these kids, etc. So I've always carried the philosophy into my coaching that 
you know, we must have a shared picture of understanding and, and, and implement that, especially around a game plan or structure that comes into play. And I'm sure all of you as coaches, you know, have this sort of a game plan. And I'll, I'll touch upon that because that's the essence of where my analysis presentation is going to go tonight. And um, I'm going to highlight some of these key teachings that we do here from a high performance aspect where I work in professional sports. OK, and please remember these these fellas, these are, are full time. They're professional athletes, uh, professional football players, and they're often at the club five or six days a week. Um, the analysis and teachings that I'll bring you through will, will hopefully unearth some questions uh, that might, you know, have that comparative analysis in terms of uh, GA, a club, county, schools level. So please feel free to ask any of those questions as we go through. Um, I just want to take you back quickly through my coaching uh, and, and through my journey so you get an understanding of how I ended up where I'm where I'm at and how I went on to coach at the Giants. And then we'll explore of the, some of the key areas that I coached, um, coached the back line with the Giants team defence, um, and also look at some of the stats that we develop, delve into. Um, the other key thing, and remember, relate it back, that if you can't explain to a six-year-old, you don't understand itself. Remember, we don't ask players to remember everything. OK, and the stuff I'll show you, certainly they don't need to know everything. Often as players, we don't let them see everything either, uh, even though uh, you would believe some of them would, would soak up the information. But we purposely don't let them see everything, even though they have so much time in their hands. And um, at the end of the day, we need them to perform, you know, 23 weeks of the year consistently and 26 weeks of the year if you're lucky enough to go all the way through to a, to a grand final. So my journey, I guess, you know, started back uh, in terms of identifying AFL around that time. Jerry was talking about back in 99 or 2000 around the international rules um, where I was lucky enough to um, come on or gain a scholarship to come to Australia to play professional rules, Australian rules football uh, with Melbourne Football Club and uh, ended up doing my year 12 here at St. Kevin's uh, in, in Melbourne. And then I was lucky enough to play professionally for, for a number of years. Then returned uh, to Ireland uh, in 04 to play and work in Cavan and for Cavan and, and Cavan Gales, my club, and whilst attending um, University of Ulster in Jordanstown. And then I went on to do some work through Satanta College as well. And um, then I went through a number of years when I was working with um, the GAA. You know, I did a lot of work with the likes of Brisbane and Collingwood and Essendon at the time where I'd self-fund some trips over to Australia to do some PD courses for myself. And that's where I sort of built up my contacts, I guess, around that sort of 05, 06 period where I was going to these clubs and trying to um, take some ideas back for the development squad structures that we're trying to build uh, in Cavan. And, and basically it was through that time I got an opportunity to go back and work with the Greater Western Sydney Giants around 2011 uh, under the legendary coach over here, Kevin Sheedy, which some of you may have heard of. And then I went on and I ended up coaching and there was a new coach of the Giants in 2014, Leon Cameron, and I went on to uh, coach the back line with him um, and team defence. Um, basically, after a conversation, when I sat down and explained roles that I had at GEA, he gave me an opportunity to work in the football development part, in, in the football development area, as opposed to the strength and conditioning area. Um, and that was through the year, the years of probably 2014, 2015, onto 2018. And now I work with the AFL Coaches Association in the area of coach education. Um, and I'm also director of coaching at, at back at my old school at, at St. Kevin's College. So it's it's pretty busy role at the moment, but, it, you know, the school stuff keeps my hands dirty in terms of getting back out on the coaching field and, and, and coaching and assessing uh, some young athletes and some young talent that are coming through through the draft system as well. So what I want to do is set the scene with a typical week um, just to show you some touch points on how time is spent at the club. Um, this is a typical pre-season schedule. Uh, okay, which which generally lasts up to pre-season generally lasts up to you know 12, 14 weeks before the home and away season uh, starts up again. And and um, with this, there's generally three main training sessions a week. You know, see on the screen there, Monday, Wednesday, Friday are highlighted as sort of your big blocks. Um, and in season, that would generally drop to two. So you could imagine the Monday session sort of disappears. 
and then you go into a main training and full day Wednesday and then sort of hits the training uh, every other day as well and then the captains run Friday before you play the game and I know this looks really really busy um, but going back to my philosophy you know less is more but we generally use you know a funnel effect so players aren't getting everything all at once but we leave them with one or two um, key points more often. This is from the education point of view uh, from, from our training. So generally we educate our players a number of times, um, probably Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the preseason. And I'll show you how around the game plan now in a few minutes. And our, one of the key points I want to really highlight that our meetings generally don't last longer than 15 minutes uh, with, our, with our players. I mentioned the funnel effect um, and to put the funnel effect into perspective, um, the head coach, um, who's your manager, has has meetings with, with all of us coaches. Um, sometimes they're a lot longer than 15 minutes, so no players involved. Uh, we as coaches then generally host the meetings with the players um, that are usually in smaller groups to encourage more participation. So for example, if I'm coaching the back line, I will then get between 10 and 15 players to work out within that meeting, even though the rest of the other coaches could be covering the same topic. Uh, we'll go through the topic that the coach generally would want to adhere to or, or want educated on that particular day. Um, sometimes if that coach needs to sort of nail a point or get a really strong message home, he'd often bring the group together to really drive that home. But that doesn't really happen much, you know, anymore, maybe once a week to really push a message through, especially coming into a big game or something like that. But what the head coach or the manager generally does now is gives the assistant coaches the autonomy uh, and the relationships with the players to build on aspects of the game plan and, and different things like that. And I'm just talking a pure analysis point of view. I'm not talking around any sort of um, um, positional or no, I am talking position. I'm not talking around any team selection or anything like that. That's generally the head coach. So head coaches to coaches, and then we generally go coaches to players. And often a lot of the times the players, especially the leaders, would also deliver some meetings to the, the players also. So they're in small refined groups. And what we generally see, and I know this is one of the questions that came in, uh, do we have any player-led initiatives um, taken on board? And very often we've got player-led uh, meetings run by the players where our coaches sit back. Now we'll set it all up for the player, uh, but generally what we see is a, a full total buy-in um, in terms of what we're what we're generally looking at. And, and at the end of the day, going back to my point earlier on, uh, we want to be on the same page when we're leaving the room to deliver out on, on the field. So during an in-season, as I mentioned, um, uh, during an in-season, um, what a typical week would look like for an AFL club and coach, let's say Saturday's game, then Sunday, um, we as a coach would code or edit or review the game. Monday, then we've got a coach's review meeting at 7 a.m. So each line, if I'm coaching the back line, um, we've got a number of KPIs that we need to adhere to. So when I was coaching the back line, the, from a defensive point of view, I'd look at percentage scored inside 50, intercept marks. This is my back line, how many intercept marks we take per game. Um, ground ball differential, so the breaking ball in the defensive zone that we look at. Uh, opposition shots from back line stoppages and, and switches from an offensive point of view. And don't get don't let the terminology let get you bogged down or anything like that. I will hit on a few things a little bit later on. And we also, from a review point of view, look at rating. So if I've got 10 backline players to rate, uh, we use generally a five-star rating category. Um, players will do this also. Um, so for example, after the game, every player, I'll text my backline players in our WhatsApp group and say, look, at, please send your ratings into me. Um, basically, the five-star ratings are one is... I, I was one of the worst players on the ground. Two, two, I was beaten by my man. Three, I played my role for the team. Four, I had a positive influence on the game. And five, I was a game changer. I played the best game ever or one of the best um, games ever in, in, my, in my career type thing. So generally what, what I'm looking for from a defense point of view is either three played my role or four, you know, positive influence on the game where, you know, I, I, I contribute um, um, I could I could contribute to um, the the offense of the game plan as well, and 
then on that Monday, we we as coaches would would have a final decision on on a game review. So from a backline point of view, I might come in with something like two hundred edits from the game, all my stats, all my analysis done uh, with my team that that have been working for me. Uh, hone that in and maybe show only two or three clips to players, and um, that's generally what what you're generally shown uh, to the players. Uh, that afternoon because again you don't want to bamboozle them you don't want to boggle them down or anything like that so we'll have that general team review on the monday and um, then after that we have a, a, a standards uh defensive standards that we do uh one percenters that we generally code looking at it from an offense and a stoppage point of view as well um then i just want to explain this then to, on, after Monday afternoon, after the full team review is done in groups, we split into our lines where we we solely focus on backline forwards and focus on forwards and mids and focus on mids. Um, and that's a really a deeper view at, of how your area sort of worked. And then Tuesday is a sort of a day where training will be flexible and players can book in for individual reviews. And then Wednesday is a time where the sort of pendulum turns where you start focusing again on the team for the next weekend. So we go opposition analysis, we go main training around how, we're, how we want to play and the coaches will go into team selection. Thursday, the day off is team announcement. And then Friday, we'll go through a number of walkthroughs and scenarios with the players. So we as coaches will have what if meetings um, and then we'll have line meetings uh, with our playing groups, look at matchups, look at different things like that. Uh, then, as I mentioned, we'll have walkthroughs on different scenarios. Captains will take the, the group for a light captain's run for 15 minutes or so, a bit of goal kicking, etc. And then Saturday is all game day. So you've, you've basically your work done um, and your pre-game lines, you'll, you'll, you'll just, just jot up a few KPIs on the board just to to put in the forefront of the, of the players minds i generally don't you know i don't interact too much with the players on game day i let them be themselves if if a player wants to do some kicking or some handballing or kick some goals out in the field or do a bit of body work or a bit of tackling early that's what i'm sort of there for um and you know from a, that defensive point of view there's a couple of buzzwords that we'll talk about and i'll keep reminding but in general come game day it's 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 over to them it's them their time to shine and then if they're not ready, you know, you know, they're not ready. They're not good enough to play essentially at, at this level. So with that in mind, you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, information that goes into it. Uh, but I'll touch upon a, a lot of these sort of stuff uh, in, in, the, in the next uh, few minutes or so. So a game plan. And we've all, all heard the terminology around a game plan. And often game plans are developed in, in pre-season phase. Uh, then they're implemented in in um, pre and early parts of the season, and then when game plan and when games begin essentially and and reviewed it, it in essentially in, in training. Um, sorry, let me just go back on that. Um, so what I'm just trying to say here, this is where performance analysis um, becomes crucial to the learnings uh, of the group. So if you, for example, go through a typical season and you develop a game plan in conjunction with your players, in conjunction with your coaches, you implement it in that early sort of phase of pre-season, in-season when games play, practice games or whatnot. And then the whole purpose of, of analysis is to critique your work of your game plan. And as I mentioned, this is exactly where the performance analysis side, it becomes crucial parts of the ongoing learnings uh, to the group. So, when we look at this, for example, okay, and this is an example of a game plan. Um, and this is one that we roll out generally at school level, you know, your, your um, Hogan Cup sort of area, your, your under 18s, under 17s, teams, kids that are just about to be drafted. So we don't make it too complex. But what we do is we generally keep the ball at the center of things. And um, the contest is, is, is a critical part of the game of AFL. And we generally break down this terminology around A, A1, win the ball, and A2, sort of support the ball or support the receiver. We talk around terminology around urgent, urgent reaction uh, offensively, the ability to move it quick. Uh, and from a defense point of view, then we look at, um, or, or from an attacking point of view, sorry, we look at um, styles of quick, 
quick play, take them on. We look at control ball build up. We look at long down the line where if we're stuck from a defensive point of view, we will go long. And we look at generally generating inside 50s or inside 45s if it was a, a GEA sense. Um, and from a defensive point of view, we look at uh, closed base tackle being, being our number one key terminology. We call that D1. So if the opposition get the ball in close, my first instinct must be to close space and tackle straight away or get up into his face and, and strip the ball. Uh, and then we talk around taking out receivers around D2 as well. And then we come up with the, the, the different layers of uh, defense as well, where we talk about locating and, and delaying. So finding the man and slowing down and not letting them play on quickly. We talk about protecting space. Um, we talk about help side run, which is sort of the, uh, the other side of the ground running to defend. And we talk about a, a 22 man defense as well, even though there's only 18 players on the side at any time. And, but there's those four chair uh, players are interchangeable. All, all that well. So you'll see how this comes into play now, now in a few minutes as well. But this is generally the different components of what we teach around the game plan. And then all our analysis would, would feed into this. And um, one of the questions that came in was around tactical periodization. And um, I'm not sure who, who answered that question, but hopefully he or she's online tonight. Um, but in terms of we, we generally don't you like tactical periodization was a, is a very soccer rugby term. It generally isn't used in the same sense in um, in in Australian rules. But it, it's what we do. The AFL is a very stoppage a scenario based game. Um, but what we do is is periodize different aspects of this sort of training and feed it into our overall uh, training loads. Uh, especially in the pre-season phase, you know, that 12 to 14 weeks that we, we get with the players. So, for example, if you look at locating delay um, in the red defensive zone, we come up with periodization of drills around locating and delaying oppositions and coming up with different games and scenarios and periodize and build that into, you know, the next layer or aspect of, of protecting space and full team defense. And, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I'll touch on some of those aspects now in a few minutes as well. Um, so the key point around our game plan is that our analysis supports uh, the way we're trying to play. And if we take, if we look from an offensive point of view, so if we look at the green for a second, um, and a key way we would like to uh, play is to take them on quickly. And we did this at the Giants as well, because we were a young side and we, we often just give them the freedom to right go go play on as quick as quick as you want play quick as you can because we were skillful enough to break through uh defenses because we did very very talented group um but if teams slow us down uh we need to obviously switch our mind very very quickly um because teams are becoming very good defensively now um that you can't go a million miles an hour all the time so we need to have a philosophy around slowing the game down sometimes and building the ball up by a foot um and again if that's hitting a brick wall on that, then we can go long down the line where because the Giants became a good stoppage team and our school teams become a good stoppage team, uh, we can force it down the line to create a boundary throw and a, create a little scrimmage or a stoppage. Uh, so we sort of reset uh, and, and go again. So our key aim, though, or any team, I guess, key aim is to, to win that football or win that footy, as we'd say here, and get it inside 50, uh, which I'll touch upon now in a few seconds. So from a defensive point of view, what we're trying to do is, is find a man um, or locate, as we call it here, and delay or slow down the opposition. So that's what you're trying to do. So we're trying to stop teams from, and every team, and this is in GA or any sort of field sport as well, you're, you're trying to stop teams or slow down oppositions from going from one end to the other in, in as quick as time as possible or as slow as time as possible. So we also encourage proactive positioning to protect space. And yeah, I see this now in GEA. And when I was home, I was home in July and I started seeing, you know, more spatial awareness come into Gaelic games um, around, you know, especially from kickouts at club level now I'm talking about. So I went to see um, a, a couple of club games when I was home. I remember Calvin Gales played Lacken and I couldn't believe, you know, the spatial awareness that was coming into the game as in zonal zonal uh, defense. I hadn't seen that at club level because I hadn't seen a club game in a, in a long time, you know, five or six years. Um, but from a proactive positioning point of view, we also speak about, you know, help side running 
as well, where it's like that offside run to get back and help the defence. It's that far wingman running behind, that unrewarded running, as I spoke about, um, that they don't get any sort of thanks or praise for. But again, as I speak about everyone playing a role and having a mantra around playing defence. So as I mentioned, these are some of the key things that we, we speak about from uh, a season, you know, a couple of years ago or it now with the school team that I'm, I'm, I'm working with. Um, but I just want to highlight entries for a second. So this, this inside 50 thing up here, which is essentially um, the key to getting the ball inside 45 and scoring. Because if you can't get the ball inside 45, we can't score. Or inside 50, we can't score. And I just want to highlight some of the key things about how we uh, analyze that from, from a uh, performance point of view. So when we get it inside 50, we look at our goal kicking and we look at key things around how efficient you know we are um so ultimately our scoring is you know the pinnacle of everything and, and like every game you know we play you got to score more than the opposition to essentially win it so what we do what we did um at the giants this is going back to 2016 or 2017 so in some of the forwards meetings and the general offensive line meetings uh, this is some. These are some of the things that we may show our players to sort of set the scene on the back of the game plan. And uh, here where we're going, we were going into the. Actually, this is a joint season put together. My bad. We were going into the 2018 season after making a preliminary final in 2017 and progressing very well uh, in the year previous as well. So essentially, what we what I've noticed here, or what we should have noticed here, and we highlight to our players that in 2016 we ranked fourth in the competition for set shots and first in 2017. So that's that's terrific. That's really really good. There's 18 teams in the competition, and you know we're first and fourth in in consecutive years. So we're in the top four, and that's where you want to be in terms of yeah, pushing for the finals. So that's a big tick, and that shows that when we go forward with the ball, we're using it well via foot, really really well. Uh, and we're actually taking a mark inside uh, 50 and as essentially as I said, we're leading the competition in that. However, okay, not every time we enter inside 50, we get a mark, okay, um, and have a chance for a set shot. I, you know, ideal world would be fantastic, but for some reason in 2016, we were very, very good at shots on the run. And then in 2017, we ranked second last. So we weren't that good. So something changed. And, and note here, we missed 23 shots or had wides, if you want to put into perspective. Mainly that could have been, you know, personnel. I know our forward line changed slightly um, or essentially could have been the opposition getting better um, and, and targeting our players and, and put more pressure on them, et cetera. But when you miss out on, on a grand final by, you know, a goal or two, um, and, we, you know, we've missed 55 shots on goal in the season, you know, we're, we're generally talking about percentages uh, from, from this point of view as well. Um, individuals get their own feedback, uh, and this is often displayed as a motivation factor uh, for everyone to see, especially in the gym and different things like that, where they're glancing all the time uh, or in their, their individual line rooms. Now, they'd only see this uh, after the player had been through it. So if I was coaching the forward line, I would take all the forwards through it, something like this to show them where they were in relation to their set shots, goals and run total percentages, etc. And, and that's something that I would leave visible and change over time if I was coaching the forward line. Um, and then I would put it up sort of as a, as a motivational factor and from a, a learning factor from everyone to see where, where people are at. And um, what you do see here is competitive training uh, come into play where the likes of the top you know, three or four players uh, are often practicing more and what we try and do is encourage um, those leaders generally to you know grab the rest of the bunch and, and, and practice shots on their own etc as as the season might might play out um, so what our analysis team does is breaks it down even further for us coaches now players wouldn't see this sort of stuff because you know you're starting to sort of lose players a little bit because you're looking at areas of the ground where they're taking shots from and um, so they won't, players won't generally see this data, but I may um, speak to an individual depending on uh, the area of the ground that they're playing on. So remember, we're talking about generally just forwards here. Um, but as I mentioned, I would sit down, explain this data maybe in a one-on-one -on -one context. Uh, and this would be basically the basis of creating craft-based training uh, for forwards at certain periods. And, and I know um, 
a question came up around walking handball games. Um, and that's some of the, we like sometimes to slow the game down uh, because you can't be on legs all the time, running, 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 because you got to play and you get tired and all this sort of stuff and the body breaks down and, you know, our sports science people generally like to have them alternate days and our craft based stuff or our walk and handball based stuff is generally activities done at a, at a, at a lot lower intensity from a walking point of view um, just to put parameters and limitations on, on, on what they're actually um, able players are able to do. In this case um, here, we're looking at improving all on all aspects, as you can see, because there's a few sort of red and oranges because we want to want to be in green um, and all aspects of, of snaps. Uh, generally, snaps are are basically, you know, shots around the body that they call here basically a Gaelic football shot in my mind. So we needed to create warm up activities um, and also, you know, craft based drills to help improve this stuff. We also came up with some you know, under fatigue based drills as well. So the main training session on a Wednesday, we might say, right, big run and load come in. We might do, you know, a 200, a 200s or something like that. Then a whistle might go and we, we get the whole team to work on, you know, under fatigue, some snaps or 30, 40 seconds, really, really quickly get five or six set shots in. Then a quick check with your team and how many did you get? I got four, I got five, I got three. It's just like an accountability uh, point of view. So one key game we played, um, for this sort of stuff to improve was that, you know, our coach, he visited Ajax, I think in 2017 or 2016 season, he brought back, you know, the old simple concept of 7v7. And he said, the Ajax, you know, plays so much 7v7, you know, similar to backs and forwards type. And I, I've been trying to explain this to him for a bit of time that, you know, Gaelic, when I was growing up and playing, we played so much backs and forward, both with Calvin Gales and Calvin all the time just to repetitively play that sort of brand and score and, and whatnot. Um, and it's not really a done thing here. Like that small side of games has come in over the last number of years, but I actually believe GEA and with the influence of soccer have, have um, are a little bit of a step ahead in terms of that game breakdown, especially at underage sort of level here and uh, where, it's, where it's still, you know, in the linear drill phase. So anyway, he, he brought this concept of seven to be seven back and we played so much back and forwards um, all, all the time. Um, you know, we, we, brought, we played it so much and, we, you know, this encouraged scoring under pressure and our numbers improved dramatically, you know, in, in, the, in the 2018 season. Um, and, you know, motivation, this sort of stuff, you know, when it's posted on, you know, walls. I'm not saying for everyone to do this at club level. It's okay at professional level where they're really held accountable. But this plays a big part in terms of motivation, especially for forwards. And often our forwards would have leadership boards like this displayed in their meeting rooms uh, to to essentially, you know, get their kicks off every week and and see where they were in terms of their in terms of their scoring. So coming back to the game plan, um, from a defensive point of view and. You know, I was lucky enough, this was the area I really coached for a number of years, being the back line and then into team defence for two years at the Giants. Um, we were lucky enough to get to three preliminary finals, which are all Ireland semi-finals. And as I mentioned, we missed out on the final until, you know, just last year we got to it. Um, but we still had the, the youngest team in, in the competition. I'm going to play a few videos, so I'm going to let these sort of play out. Um, and hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll loop in. So I'll talk over them and I'll, I'll come back to the points. So from a defensive point of view, one of the key aspects that I coached was D1. Remember that big D, close space and tackle, you know, at the source and D2, which was essentially taking out receivers. And um, this is very, very specific to the game. The tackle is very, very specific to the game, but not too dissimilar to Gaelic. Just obviously you can't, you know, wrap and tackle, but um, another aspect of, about AFL is, you know, you coach your area and you coach your role. So my key thing was, you know, I was in charge of this area with one other coach and we, it was up to us to coach this really, really well. And this is one of the clips that we would, would take out of games each week about, you know, have we closed space tackle really well? You know, are we beginning to take out receivers? You know, why isn't there a player up on this? And, and this is the sort of division that we would, we would go through and, um, what we what we want is is to be able to highlight a clip like this post game 
um, where we would code all everything and, and, and review with individuals essentially. So what I would do, for example, here, if you look at the tackler, um, I would code all the tacklers clips or all the tackles and then go through his individual tackles uh, maybe come you know Tuesday or Wednesday that week before we roll into the following week. So our weekly KPI around this was 80 tackles. So we wanted to become a really good tackling team. Uh, we broke that down into 20 per quarter. And there was obviously some weeks we, we didn't make that and some weeks where we went over 100. And it was a, it became a really good indicator of what giant side um, basically rocked up the play on, on, any given, on, on any given game day or any given day, essentially. When we came to tackle, we generally won. And when we, we, we broke 80 tackles and kept the ball off the opposition, uh, in terms of an uncontested mark point of view, we generally won the game and, and, and it goes without saying. So back to this sort of tackling regime here, what I would then do is break it down into individual with individual players. So for example, this is some of our, our, our young guns that were coming through. Um, this would be generally from a particular game or over a course of a few weeks where each player would get um, an RFI. RFI means room for improvement. We generally don't speak around a negative uh, and key focus to work on in terms of the tackle tech session. So we'd have specific tackle tech session might be a, um, a, a 20 to 30 minute tackle tech session. Again, lower intensity craft type walk and handball game type, as I mentioned before, and then build this into the main training uh, for that week. Uh, so as well, and players often sourced you on this because they knew it was a, a KPI of the team or other coaches to get better. And, and one of the key components of defense was, was delaying the opposition. But essentially, if you if that could be done at the source, i.e. the tackle where the football is, then it's important to be good at this area of the game. So our midfield group became, you know, very, our, our, they, they are very, very good tacklers uh, right at this stage and, and are renowned uh, in the competition with, it, with, with Richmond and, and the Bulldogs and a few other key teams that are in the, you know, top four in the competition. Um, another metric, and, I, and I'll play this uh, clip out as well, uh, this is around finding the man and, and locating an opponent, um, and this is actually an RFI, so a room for improvement. So another key part of my role was this team defence and looking at opposition's uh, area of fast play. So this is a free kick in the opposition's back line, they're getting it out quick, they're going through the middle of ground, and if he was able to execute that skill, uh, we would have been under pressure in the back line. Um, so ultimately, with with the key to successful team defenses is turning their fast play into slow play. This is what we're we're basically trying to coach. So in this case, take a look at this clip. Um, it'll just continue to loop. You'll notice the opposition are getting out, um, and notice how easily it is if a player doesn't find a man, and not his man. I'd say a man. Uh, that teams can cut cut you into or could cut you into, and if we look at this defensive action, um, we would then go back and and look at these key areas around locating and delaying. So let me talk you through this one for a second. So we we would say free kick opposition. Have we manned the mark really well? Yeah, not too bad. Have we located our players? If you look at a red circle, there's one free. There's one of our midfielders running around headless. He hasn't urgently located anyone opposition are out and these are sort of the clips that we would show in a monday review um at the time of of, of doing our whole team review and then try and capture the decision around it and train again and what we would do is generally ask the player you know what happened here why did you go to the opposition ruckman who you wouldn't be never you would never be on what was going through your mind and simply he might say you know i i just didn't uh, i wasn't able to find my opponent now from a proactive positioning point of view, he could have been helped. He could have been helped out a little bit because some of the forwards just went to locate, i.e., find a find a man. But we could have easily dropped back uh, slightly to help him out there as well. So all the onus, all the blame is on that person at any one given time. But what we do is we we go back and, and capture this in training, uh, and we go back to the areas of our game plan, uh, and we look at how we generally educate it and, and review it. Uh, from that point of view as well. So here's here's a, a clip. Um, um, here's a clip on how we generally view. And this is this is a, a scenario based game. Again, I'm going to let it um, play out. 
Um, but what we're going to do is we, we highlight things not only using stats, but we also use education co uh, tool called Piero. Uh, to, it really helps players with a visual point of view. Uh, we're lucky enough to have this at our disposal. And I know a lot of inter-county teams are using this sort of stuff. Uh, but in a small learning environment at club level um, or whatnot, it might not or won't be available. But it, it's a really good educational tool. Um, this can be done, you know, from a walkthrough point of view or even with magnets or cones. Um, and you can use a variety of, of it all And if you have it at your disposal. And what I'm going to just highlight here is I'll start the clip again. It's not too dissimilar to the last clip. And apologies, I'm, I'm looking at two screens when we're doing this. But essentially, we've noticed a live ball situation. And our mantra is to come forward and locate an opponent. We've done that really well there. He comes forward to defend. And now, now we have decisions to make. Essentially, we've got decisions to make. And especially with our backline players, what are, are these decisions? Uh, does he come forward to defend? Uh, does he trust that the, the 18 or the 22 man defense and the help side run would be coming from that other side to help out? And essentially, that's what we're trying to educate and help. Because if we look at that previous clip, you know, we didn't locate early because maybe the trust wasn't there. We're, we're not sure. It's hard to replicate on any any one given time. And essentially what we're trying to do is, is um, replicate, you know, game-based activities through, you know, I think it's 11 v 11 here that we're playing or something like that, maybe 12 v 12, and and develop this in, in, our, in our different training models uh, that we're trying to put, put out there. Um, good question has just come in. I just seen it popped up from Kevin. How much time uh, do we spend on working on scanning on, uh, on a, as a particular skill we, we build scanning um into all of our game sense stuff especially from you know an, an, an office an offense point of view because you want to be able to move your head as as much as possible but we always we talk about putting your your head on a swivel all the time all the time head on a swivel head on a swivel you'll hear that terminology if you're at any one of our, the giants training sessions um so it comes a key it's not that it's 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 used as a, a specific uh, thing we coach, but it's it's in our terminology and in our wording and in players obviously bring it into games as well um, into all our in, into all all the stuff we do. Um, so just moving on, you know, stats play obviously an important role as well, and and often they they tell or you get them to tell a very nice story in relation to motivating a team or or tasking a team with a specific challenge. So. I just want to take you through this little scenario. Um, don't get bamboozled by percentages or figures or anything like that. I'll talk you through the situation. Um, but essentially, in 2017, we were in the middle of the year. We played the Western Bulldogs. Um, we were ranked 16th, okay, against um, for inside 50 kicking. So the opposition for the ability for the opposition to go from one end of the ground to the other, we were ranked 16. So we're talking kick-ins here or kick-outs. It's the opposition kicking out the ball against us, okay? So we were ranked 16th uh, for inside 50s against for opposition kick-ins and 18th last in the competition for forward half entry. So for teams to be able to get it past that midline like you see in the screen. Um, we couldn't stop teams from kick-ins early in the season. We, we just couldn't. And... If you can cast your mind back, um, the style of play that we like to play was take them on quickly, fast play, go, all that sort of stuff. Okay. We were ranked also 17 for snaps or goals on the run. Um, so we were moving the ball really, really fast, getting it inside 50. Um, then we were ranked 17 for kicking a wide, essentially. And that, that's what generates a kick in. Um, so if you can imagine, we're going flat chat. And I'm not making up excuses for the side here. But if we add in a team that who wants to play a million miles an hour, plus a team that ranked second last for scoring, again, are scoring when playing like it, 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 it also goes towards the bottom for defense in terms of the youngest team in the competition. So what I generally say, and I was trying to point this out to our coaches at the time, it's, it's like running a, like a 100-meter race, and Usain Bolt was waiting at the other end to basically go as quick as possible and you have to chase him. Because what we were doing was playing on so fast, getting it inside 50, not scoring, and then we had to slow down the opposition from a fast point kicking. You know, obviously your team were ranked, 
you know, number one for forward half entries and forward, uh, so four for, for forward 50 inside safety. So we had a massive task on our hands to stop this, okay? But we did during that year, and I'll show you how, okay? In the previous week, uh, this is against Sydney Swans, uh, the previous week we played the Bulldogs and in the weeks leading up to this, this painted a picture. Um, we, we played the Swans and we looked at a clip like this. Uh, and this is in terms of us having a, it was a bit scrappy here. We had a shot on goal. We miss. Okay. Then it's an opposition fast play kick in. Um, and they were able to go from basically one end of the ground to the other or coast to coast, as we call it here. So this is really poor defense because Opposition's able to get it, uncontested mark, get it. And look, we're, we ended up just chasing. It ends up being even numbers up the ground and you end up chasing your ass for, for the day. You know, and, and this became a sort of a sequence. And that's why we were, I was sort of pulling out my hair at the time because we were last for, uh, in the competition in, in relation to these stats, opposition mark. So what we did was, um, it was a real area of concern for us and, and our head coach, you know, we played the Bulldogs following week. Our head coach, Leon Cameron, didn't want to fail because the Bulldogs were his old team. He played with them. Uh, he coached there as well. And as they're a very, very good, strong scoring side, we we had to come up with a plan to sort of stop them from going basically one end of the ground uh, to the other. And as I mentioned, uh, margins in most sports are so tight. But if we could stop one area and score in another, we could have a big, it could have a big influence on where you finish at a particular given time. So uh, from an opposition um, fast point kicking point of view, what we were generally trying to do is stop the opposition from going one end of the ground. So we had a kick, we missed, the opposition had a kick in. All right, generally goes a bit quicker than this. Generally what teams do is push out to the pockets or push out to the corners. Uh, to, to get a quick kick in. What we were doing, and this was our game plan prior to this game, was going out here with them because we wanted to locate and delay. We didn't want to give up the easy kick. But what this highlighted for us was this area. And if you look back on this previous clip, like look at where, um, when this kicking comes up. Sorry, scrappy, scrappy, scrappy. Okay, watch where Sydney Swans get their first kick. And guys, I, I know we're, we're coming up to 45 minutes, so I should be another couple of five minutes or so. Hopefully people can hang in there. Um, so Franklin gets kicking in that red zone that we, we don't want. So as I mentioned, we, we focus our fast uh, point kick-ins from here. So what we were doing is giving up this space, essentially. And we can't because it was absolutely killing us. Okay, that's what was happening and teams were going Wishka. So what we, what one of our key things we did for that week was just retract or retreat, pull our players back, and we said we'd give up the pockets and force that that um, that kick in to the pocket. So that player couldn't get that kick. We would give up that area of the ground, let the kick go there, and because we're a good stoppage side, force them down the line and create a stoppage, and hopefully we would win it back and get get numbers from there. So let's look at this point of view, and again, this is the educational. Uh, point of view, what we're looking at. Uh, and this again is that PR tool I spoke about. So players can actually visualize what we're doing. So this case, fast play, no score. Remember from the PowerPoint, we want to stop teams from launching the attack into the red zones. And essentially we want to give up the pockets. So this demonstrates what, you know, when we can top in the game when leading into the weekend. So essentially this is what we're trying to uh, show our players. And Sydney were able to get away with it too easy. So it highlights the positional change required for our players. So from visually, it was really, really good that we were able to show our players this sort of stuff. So this is too easy. If we had a player back there, this would have been stopped straight away. So we worked really hard on it. So as a result, the following week, um, we worked on our delay to nullify the dogs from the scoring and the kickouts, uh, which, you know, which was a, a major win for us that day and it actually changed our season. So from this clip, you'll see um, the players generally normally would have gone man on man. Okay, they'd normally go man on man. But what they have done now is is retreated and, and took that space. The kick is, is forced into that 
uh, area and it's kicked long down the line and we we get to turn it over so in previous weeks you know our player would have gone out to the boundary with him it would have opened up that whole space and you know we would have been left sort of um chasing our ass down the other end of the ground trying to to defend so what i'm trying to get the point i'm trying to get across is 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 essentially is that with growth learning and growth mindset from our players and as the players evolve as football players um, whether it be amateur or professional, you know, there is learnings that they can take in 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 in, in through the games. And look, I had a, a number of other slides that we could talk about around areas of high performance and different things like that. And unfortunately, you know, we can't get through everything um, essentially this evening. But in summary, you know, analysis in, in AFL or in any game, you know, it, it's a major role to develop. Uh, but also it's more importantly to implement and review your team performance. So without a game plan, we can't have, you know, a hype or a, a performance analysis point of view. Um, so the role that the analysis plays is it definitely develops players. It implements what you're trying to do and it reviews, you know, your team's overall performance. And as I mentioned, you know, there is many tools that you can use to review performance and educate players in different aspects of, of the game, including, you know, your own vision, if you can take it, you know, walkthroughs are a big thing for me, uh, magnets and cones, because at school level, we don't have vision. So we use so many walkthroughs and magnets and and, and, and playing scenarios and different things like that as well. And, but please remember, player buy-in is crucial and having a collaborative approach is key uh, to everyone being on, on the same page. And Remember, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, six you, you're, you're not going to understand it or you don't understand it yourself. So um, thanks. Hopefully everyone got a bit out of that this evening. Um, I'm, please feel free to um, um, ask as many you know, questions as you can. I'm, I'm in no rush. It's my early morning, so I'm, I'm, I'm staying around for a little while. So thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Owen, boys are boys are gone. Be, no, that should be Jer. Jer's on mute. Yeah. Sorry, Nicholas. Thanks very much for that. I'm not sure right. if, you hear, if you heard me there, but it was really really interesting. Um, I like the very first part of um, I like the very first part of, of of your presentation where you talked about the vision and the journey that you're going on, and I think that's something that's critical for I suppose for for for, a big, for, for certainly for coaches that are new to a group and certainly new to, to a team, that people um, will travel along the road with them once they understand the bigger picture and can see that. Um, yeah. And I, I, I like the way that you talked about that, that shared, shared picture of your players. Um, just a couple of questions that, that came in previously. We might yeah. maybe just uh, look at some of those maybe and, and um, get you maybe to, 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 to give your thoughts on some of them. Um, I have a have a question here just in relation to um, what what are the top three parameters that you would measure players' performance uh, to ensure that they're ready for for match day? Yeah, that's it. I saw that question coming in. I own flick one to me, and I actually find it really hard to answer it. You know, because it all depends on what style of play you're you're playing. You know what I mean? If, if you're going to be a team that's going to set up the wall and, and, and defend, then the parameters should be around defense. But if you're going to have, you know, different things, parameters around attack, then they should be around different attacking metrics. So my, my general answer to that would be to make sure that your analysis reflects what you're actually, what way you're trying to play. That, that's the key thing for me. Um. Next question, Nick. So, and you mentioned about the game plan, develop, implement, review, and you also talked about um, that you as coaches and you specifically might ask a player individually um, about what, how they think or how they think it went. In terms of the player groups that you put the players in, is there at any stage that they come up with um, uh, um, room for improvement within their own groups for what they're doing, for what they're seeing? from the coaches in terms of their own performance? 
yeah, most definitely. Yeah, yeah, most most definitely. On, on and it, it generally stems from your individual one on one meetings for them. So I should have probably explained that. Like if I was having a one on one with you and you were after playing on the weekend, my general meeting would consist of right. You know what was your rating? You might say I give you gave you might say I gave myself a four. Well, I say well I'll give you I'll tell you my rating in a second or I'll go through it straight away. I give you a three for example, and then we'll discuss the why out of it. So I think you're a three why. I think you're you think you're a four why. Generally, I love division to back it up. Okay, because of that, but not every club player uh, would have the luxury around that. And then after all those individual meetings, we'll have our line meeting or even before that. And then they may come up with a collective area that they might want to get better. For example, if it's back 50 stoppages and teams are scoring against them, then we would say, right, room for improvement is to lock down our opponent and to make sure the midfielders are, midfielders are organized to get someone as well because we have to protect our, our house, essentially. So often, very often, um, we would have a collaborative approach to coming up to you know, those KPIs leading into the weekend. Uh, Nicholas, I think there's a <clears throat> cavalryman that wanted to ask you a question. I, I'm, I'm guessing that... There, um, he's asking about the high catch more around the technical question around... He uh, makes the point that when you were, when you were minor, you were particularly uh, good at high fielding. Just what teachings or learnings from, from Aussie rules on, on teaching the high catch at an at a, at a underage level could you impart to the coaches here tonight? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I do get asked it a fair bit of time. We do, like there is aspects of uh, teaching catching. I think that the two differences, or sorry, the two, the one difference between Gaelic and Australian rules is that we're taught here to catch at the furthest point away from the body. Where I remember in Gaelic, you're, you're taught to, you know, take it in your chest type thing. Now, there's different comparisons of all, of all this. Aussie rules tends to take it at the furthest point away from the body. That's number one, okay? Um, and, and, and on the run, but also in terms of physically jumping, you know, do we, we do teach, you know, flight mode and different things like that to jump into, you'll see these big packs on backs and different things like that, just the timing of, of, of the actual jump as well. But you also have to look at the ball flight. The ball flight in AFL is like a bull toe kicking, a kick out from off the ground. Remember those old bull toes that would hang up and up and up and keep rising and rising? You know, we, we'd have a few back in Cavan in the, in the time, so you get a lot of practice jumping into them. But that's the flight sometimes of the AFL ball. So it actually gives you time to fly in the air and you'll see the specky on, on someone's back here. Whereas in Gaelic football, it's generally flatter and you don't get that hang time in the air uh, to, to jump at the football. Then you bring in the physical aspects of you know, strength and conditioning and everything like that. So there's a number of factors, Jared, that feed into that. But my one key point around, you know, high feeling, taking it out as far as possible, you know, with good, strong, semi-bent arms is, the, is one of the key components of, of, of your jump to catch that, that first point away from the body. So your defender or other midfielder can't reach it from, from behind. Because if you're in here, they're able to get a fist in somehow and pop it out, I guess. Okay. Thanks for that, Nicholas. Uh, next one, Nicholas, again, uh, in relation probably to a little bit of the meditation, there was one question on meditation, but there's one that you would have maybe seen earlier on in the question we sent through. So what techniques or processes help you or the coaches or the analysts detach from the emotion of a game when analysing it live? Is there anything yeah. to do specifically? <laughs> Apart from deep breathing. <laughs> yeah. Or don't sit beside the head coach or in the coach's box. That was a that was a big one. Now look at um to touch on that aspect of meditation, the question that came in, and, and also I'll probably bring in the um I can also touch on benefits of youths here playing uh, multi sports as well. Okay. My my key thing with any sort of performance-based thing, whether you are coaching or you are playing, if you're getting enough rest, i.e. sleep, you're hydrating adequately, you're eating well. Those two or three key factors, then you're able to constantly perform. Um, you know, sleep, hydration, nutrition—they're th big three, right? Without 
So that sort of then, if a young kid is playing multi sports and is able to do it, then if he's getting or she's getting enough sleep, hydration, nutrition, and from a coaching point of view, then if you set yourself up and if I'm coming tired to the game and different things like that, I'm not going to be able to handle the the, the pressures of game day uh, that and and going to be physically able to concentrate on giving my best at that and at that given time. We brought in meditation, I guess, um, to essentially because football is such a high performing environment and a lot of the time it's it's go 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 you often forget to you know take your minute or so and slow down so what we did was bring in meditation a number of years ago um where we had a meditation coach come in and work with us on compulsory meditation for uh two 20 minute blocks in, in the day now i'm not a personally i'm not a massive believer in in meditation i've done it and i do it often and um, but when i do do it i find the benefits in it so I don't, I'm, I'm not going to rubbish it because I, I, I'm not into it. My meditation is now getting out for a run or doing a bit of boxing or something like that. That's my meditation because I don't do it that often anymore. So people that meditate um, meticulously, like our football players at the moment, it's a sense of them coming down from something and then able to perform in the afternoon, i.e. in the gym or back out on the field as well. All the players swear by it now. They love it and they do it religiously you know, twice a day for about 15 or 20 minutes. Thanks. I'm just, I'm just t uh, conscious of, of your time, Nicholas. Um, so I'm just going to combine these two questions. Um, uh, one is on the GPS and just, is there, is there um, use in it in the AFL and is it it's something that um, is used? And, and the other question then is just around um, KPAs. So, what would the difference be for, say, somebody in a school setting, um, yeah. say, eight, under 18, under 19, compare that to, say, a professional? Would there be different uh, um, performance indicators that you're, that you're measuring? Or are they pretty much the same? Yeah, look, I'll start with the GPS question, I guess. Um, GPS is commonly used in, in AFL, even, mm -hmm. even in schools competitions now, Ger. You know, it's, it's, it's used. Um, in school, we use it more from just a load point of view, just to see that we're not overdoing it with our players, because often our schools based players, especially the top end talent are playing in representative leagues and similar, you know, the county minor teams and all that sort of stuff similar to home. So we just look at that from a, a load comparison point of view. From an AFL point of view, at professional level, it's widely used, you know, we use it for, you know, all our metrics or load, all our training base. Um, we look at all the data through our, um, you know, meters per minute or sprint distance, etc. cetera. Um, we've even have broken down that our halfbacks need to be getting, you know, X number of, of meters gained in a particular game to be able to perform. Now, again, we don't de delve into all that information with the players. You know, we keep it sort of from a coaching point of view. Um, but what we generally do is, is if a player from a halfback point of view, isn't getting, you know, enough run in the game. We'll have a conversation with that player to get him into the game. I would never go to a player saying, well, you're, you know, you're only at hundred meters per minute today. We need you to improve. There's so many influencing factors that come into uh, GPS and the game that, you know, could, could change sort of, you know, in the course of a quarter or whatnot. Um, it's a really, really, really good reference point. And it's a really good point, uh, point of view. It's a really good tool to use from a point of view of, of tracking live data in terms of our rotation, spinning the wheels of our midfielders as well. In terms of KPIs, um, if you look at AFL, you may have the full suite of everything, where at school level, I would only take components. So from a team defense point of view at AFL level, if, let's say I maybe five KPIs at school level or under 18 level, I might only have one or two. You know, so I wouldn't wouldn't delve into bam, bamboozling them with all these statistics at school level because at the end of the day, they're they're seventeen or eighteen years of age. They're going to school. They want to enjoy their football. Maybe one or two of our players might get drafted. So most players are just playing for a bit of fun anyway. So you don't want to make it too constrained, um, and to have to follow all these KPIs and parameters and whatnot. As I said in my philosophy earlier on, you know, you you, you keep it simple. 
um, and, and keep it basic and players will generally uh, enjoy it much more. Top class, Nick. Um, again, guys, just before Jared comes on to uh, wrap everything up, um, this webinar will be up on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Again, use the Dublin GA webinar uh, hashtag if you're using social media and please promote as much as you can and thanks for everybody for joining us. Okay, Nick, Nicholas, thanks very much for, for your time and for getting up early, uh, earlier than, than we are uh, to prepare for today and um, hopefully uh, it won't be it won't be too long before we were able to meet up in person and mm -hmm. um, and have a have a have a have a chat or even go along to a match uh, uh, in the near future. So listen, okay. thanks very much for your time. Uh, hope every 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 all, all of your family are safe and well, and uh, we look forward to uh, meeting up sometime soon. So thanks very much, Nicholas. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, boys, and uh, good luck to everyone. And and over the next sort of five or six weeks, you know, really try and do something for yourself and you know, your family to get out and about if you can and, and stay active. And um, I have been seeing clips of the, the fittest family wall challenge. So uh, hopefully everyone is, is on to that as well. So good stuff.